Rosanna Castiglione is a distinguished scholar. We're grateful to have her here. Uh, she holds a PhD in political science uh, from the University of Notre Dame. Um, she is full professor of political science and the Dean of Social Sciences and History, as I mentioned, at Universidad Diego Portales. Uh, she is a co-founder uh, of uh, the Latin American Network on Analysis of Social Policy, the co-editor of JPLA, which is the Journal of Politics in Latin America. Uh, she is a specialist particularly in uh, the comparative social policy of Latin America, and uh, one of my favorite topics, which is the dilemmas of democratic representation. Um, she's well-traveled and has been uh, a professor at many institutions, including Harvard, uh, at, in Florence, Italy, at the Kellogg Institute for International Studies, at Leiden University, and the University of Oxford. Um, she uh, is published across a wide range of academic journals, uh, such as the Journal of Social Policy, Latin American Politics and Society, the Journal of Compar uh, Comparative Policy Analysis, uh, Developing Economies, and Electrical Studies. Um, her book, uh, The Politics of Social Policy Change in Chile and Uruguay, uh, was uh, published and then reprinted uh, uh, in a second printing in 2013. Um, her last book, um, with a number of co-authors, is titled The Political Economy of Segmented Expansion, um, published by Cambridge University Press um, in 2022. Um, so uh, we, uh, we look forward to learning a lot uh, from Professor Castiglione. Uh, she uh, is an outdoors enthusiast, and uh, that's matched only by her interest in family history. And so... Uh, uh, this is a great place to think about family history. <laughs> uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Castiglione to BYU. I will put the timer first, just in case I'm not talking too much, which is my speciality always, <laughs> as my family says. Um, well, Thank you so much for the invitation and for the generous presentation. Um, today, well, you will see the title there, I won't repeat it, but today I want to talk about two main puzzles. The first puzzle has to do with the fact that Chile has been considered one of the most successful Latin American countries at many levels. However, citizens have been increasingly unrest. They are disappointed about democracy, uh, interpersonal trust has been going down. They are not, uh, they don't like the way the democracy works. So why a country that is doing so well has uh, citizens that are so um, uh, how do, disappointed about the way democracy works? The second puzzle has to do with uh, the solution to a wave of protest that the country experienced. And in order to remove people from the street, the government allowed for a new constitution. However, and this was one of the key demands of protesters, however, there were two attempts to reform the constitution that failed miserably. So why one of the key demands of those in the streets didn't lead to a reform? So let me start with the, same th the, same, uh, the first puzzle. Um, in October 2019, Ch Chile experienced uh, an increase in the price of transportation. It was four cents, four American third cents, uh, in the, the increase of the subway. Uh, high school students started to protest uh, about this increase and call others to avoid paying the fare. What started as isolated events turned very rapidly in massive waves of protest. Most of them were pacific, but some of them were really violent with looting, destruction of public and private property, uh, uh, human rights violation by the police, and also um, many people hurt. The president at the time, Sebastián Piñera, um, used repression as the main weapon to uh, remove people from the street. And this picture was very famous because in a country with an authoritarian legacy, to have the president talking 
about a war, saying that the country was at war, and calling the military to to provide social service, uh, uh, social safety with the public safety with the police was quite a shock. Uh, however, this only increased the level of protest, and this was the largest mar march of them all. This was about 1.2 million people mobilized in the entire country in October 25 just a few days after uh, these mobilizations started. Within a month, 4.5 million Chileans went to the streets. So we are talking about massive protests. And to put these figures into context, you have to think that the president received 2.8 million votes. So more people in the street protesting than those that voted for the president. Um, one of the things that sur surprised me a lot was the surprise of the government. You know, the president said, "I didn't see this coming." The spoken woman of the of of, um, of the president said the same. The minister of finance says we didn't we were unable to read the unrest or the dissatisfaction of, of, of the people in Chile. So one question that many people ask is, were, were politicians delusional? You know, uh, why didn't politicians see it coming, or at least the government? Well, I think there are very good reasons to not expect a wave of mobilizations. If you look at the transition to democracy, Chile had a, a, a very um, uh, violent and, and, and uh, long dictatorship. There was human rights violation. People were demobilized. So everyone thought that the transition to democracy in Chile was going to be problematic, but that was not a problem at all social democrat president, then a socialist, and, and that was, you know, people were scared, like there was going to be a zombie apocalypse or something because of a socialist president, nothing happened. So transition was really smooth. If you take any indicator of democracy, this is one, electoral democracy index, with, uh, I took this from the database of varieties of democracy, one is a full democracy, zero is a full autocracy, and look at Chile, the red line is very close to Greece and Portugal and way above the Latin American average, which is in blue. If you look at economic variables, and this is one that I took, uh, this is GDP per capita. Look how close to uh, the average of Latin America was Chile in 1990, the year of the transition, and look what it looks now, you know. Uh, there was a steady increase of GDP per capita, and again, Chile is closer to Portugal and Greece than to the average of Latin America. And this is probably the most impressive um, indicator. If you take any social indicator, you will see an improvement in any. This is one very basic indicator, poverty by income, and look how steady the decrease was. So um, this uh, performance of Chile created a sort, sort of narrative that the country was an example, that it was going to be developed by 2025, that the country was going to lead the growth, uh, economic growth in a year that was very difficult, 2019. Well-known leaders like Obama praised the Chilean democracy, and I could follow and follow and follow. And even the president, uh, it's sounding okay, the mic, yeah? Uh, even the president, and look at the date, this was only a few days before the social explosion, he said this that became very famous, in the midst of this convoluted Latin America, Chile is a true oasis. And then, boom, the social explosion. So... The idea that Chile was a model country was not new. This guy here, Milton Friedman, who was one of the professors of the young economists that pushed for neoliberal reforms in the dictatorship, uh, coined the term 
The Miracle of Chile, El Milagro de Chile. And I did a search in the internet, and if, the, and if Google says it, it has so many entries, it has to be true. No, there has to be a miracle. I trust Google PhD a lot. So um, let me talk a little bit, this is a parenthesis, about the two main legacies of the dictatorship. that probably are behind social unrest. The first is this book called The Brick, El Ladrillo. This was not a book initially. It was a program that the neoliberal team, these Chicago boys, wrote for um, the conservative candidate, uh, Alessandri, who ran against Allende. So when Allende won, this you know, program of economic development was not used at all, but after the coup d'etat, three days after the coup d'etat, the Chicago boys went to the presidential palace and said, we have the solution for this country's problem. So the book has two parts. The first, a diagnosis. The second, a full list of recipes to push for neoliberalism. The second a pillar of authoritarianism or the authoritarian legacy is the 1980 constitution. And this constitution, I'm going to be really a reductionist here, has two main goals. The first goal was to protect the economic development uh, model, you know, so to make sure that neoliberalism would prevail after the dictatorship ended. And the second one was to uh, install a series of rules that made structural reforms very difficult to pass. So um, the two main pillars are a combination of neoliberalism and institutional rigidity. These rigid laws were not only in the Constitution, but the Constitution was a big part. There were other uh, laws that were important too. So going back to uh, the, um, the social explosion, this wave of mobilizations, uh, one of the key questions is why Chile did experience a social explosion after seeing all the indicators. And my explanations have three components. I'm sure there are other components to take into account, but I think these are the three more important uh, explanations. The first has to do with the paradox that Chile reduced poverty dramatically, but when you reduce poverty, middle income earners increase. And the percentage of the population that we can call lower middle income uh, earners was 40, is 42% in Chile. So they earn less than they spend, they are highly indebted. They hear all this narrative about success of the country and say, what's going on with me, uh, they take credit to buy food, transportation, health, and um, I'm forgetting something, that is like 60% of all the expenditures of a household. And this is a population, this 42% is a population that earns between one and a half lines of poverty and three lines of poverty. So they cannot uh, get to the end of the month with their salaries. Their salaries are insufficient. They start to accumulate uh, malice. They are not happy about the, this, uh, this situation, so they go to the street trying to repoliticize inequalities. As you know, in Latin America, inequalities are a structural problem, but for some reason, sometimes it becomes a political problem. And here it became obviously a political problem because there was a push from below. So they go to the street to protest and they clash with a, a, a rigid set of institutions that were not built to process uh, this social unrest institutionally, but to maintain the statu quo. So we were sort of, sort of sitting on a volcano, and this volcano exploded uh, in 2019.
so um after the the social explosion took place uh and repression failed as a main measure to to remove people from the street a debate regarding reforming the constitution or having a new constitution emerge there were two main um arguments or two main reasons why um uh, scholars and policymakers were pushing for a new constitution. The first was rather symbolic and had to do with legitimacy. This was a constitution that was written during a dictatorship without debate, without participation, without deliberation, with human rights violations, so it was illegitimate. So we are not talking about the content itself of the constitution, but the way it was produced. Then there were other arguments, and this is any new, this says 13 shortcomings of the constitution. There were plenty of newspaper articles saying there were five forecomings, 20 forecomings, whatever. But the problem was the content of the constitution. It was not only a legitimacy problem, but there were rules that promoted the statu quo that needed to change in order to pass the reforms that Chile needed. That's, that's the narrative, that's not necessarily my opinion. Um, so the second thing had to do with the constitutional solution, you know. Um, all political parties wanted to appease protesters. It, it, it is impossible to live in a city that has months of uh, constant mobilizations and protests. So, uh, and there were two, two main visions here too. One group of those who were um, thought a, a, constitution, a new constitution was necessary to appease um, those protesting had to do with the fact that it was necessary to incorporate the key grievances of protesters. So things will come and people will go home. Others saw a new constitution as an opportunity to promote radical reforms in the other, not in the neoliberal direction, but just the opposite. So um, in November 15, 2019, almost a month after the protests started, all political leaders from all the political parties with representation in, in Congress, with the exception of the Communist Party, agreed on uh, having a new constitution. So people in the street, of course, saw this as a major triumph, you know, they won. The constitution of Pinochet was going to be uh, changed and this change was going to be important. So, the first process, because there were two processes of constitutional change, the first process was a product of this peace agreement among political parties, and um, they decided that the, there was going to be a, a plebiscite that could allow people take two decisions. The first, whether they wanted or not a new constitution. The second was about the mechanism, whether they wanted a constitution written by a constitutional convention of elected citizens that would be elected just for that purpose, or a convention that could be form or uh, integrated by half uh, legislators and half elected citizens. So the result of this first uh, election that took place in October 25, 2020 was overwhelming. 78% of those who cast a vote voted for a new constitution and 79% voted for a convention of citizens. L and, and please pay attention to the word new. This is quite interesting. We were not talking about a constitutional reform. This was going to be a constitution written from scratch, an hoja en blanco, a white paper. So anything could enter there. There were no boundaries. 
Um, so for any measure to enter uh, in the text, it had to be approved by two thirds of the members of the Constitutional Convention. The convention had gender parity and it reserved 17 seats for indigenous people. So um, in May, uh, in two days, because it was in the midst of the pandemic, uh, 155 conventional members were elected. Um, then we had the entry plebiscite to decide if a constitution was going to be there. Then there was the exit plebiscite. And the exit plebiscite was supposed to um, be an instance in which uh, citizens would be um, voting against or in favor of this new constitution. And it failed miserably. 62% of all those who casted a vote voted against the constitution. So I never never received so many calls in my entire adult life of people asking, what happened, you know? And, okay, this second part is going to be a, a bit speculative because I have, I, I have conducted research on the social explosion, but this is more anecdotic in a way, I don't know, uh, or it's an informed guess. I think we need a lot of qualitative research and probably political psychologists to understand this, this problem. So um, there were many factors why uh, the Constitution was rejected. The first most important and obvious factor was that during the entry plebiscite, vote was voluntary. But during the exit plebiscite, it was mandatory. Generally in Chile, only half of the population votes and the rest do not vote. That was historically. So we didn't know that much about the other half. And the other half seemed to be much more conservative than progressive uh, people who wrote the Constitution expected. Um, so if you think that in the first plebiscite, voted 51% of the other population that could vote, and they voted in favor, we can say that 39% of all people with the age of voting supported the new constitution, not 50%. I, I don't know if that's, if you understand what I'm, what I'm saying. So, uh, those who were in favor of the constitution were not a majority or not necessarily. The second had to do with the characteristics of the convention. It was a highly heterogeneous convention. 42% of those elected were uh, independent. You know, when we were watching the TV the day of the election, uh, for many elected conventionals, people, uh, the channels, TV channels didn't have a picture. So it was like an image. You know, generally when you have someone elected, you have the pictures there. These people were so unknown that there were not pictures. We, we were Googling like maniacs to find out who they were. Um, and I think it's about 70% of all that were part of the convention did not have previous political experience, were not affiliated to a political party, didn't have negotiation skills. And finally, most of the independents were single issue oriented. So they got to the convention because they were feminists, they got to the convention because they were environmentalists, they got there because they were, I don't know, fighting for indigenous rights, and they didn't care about the rest. So the most weird alliances happened there because if you don't care about the rest, you negotiate with whomever will give you the vote for your issue, you know. So, I, and I have to say something horrible happened to me. I talked to a former student who was a conventional member, and he said, you know what, professor, everything we learn is useless. 
And I said, why are you saying that? I was almost wanted to cry. And he said, because you don't, I mean, even if you know a lot about making a coalition and negotiating, they are not interested in that. So it's very difficult to negotiate with these independent people that are single-oriented, single-issue-oriented. Then uh, there was some controversial content in the, in the Constitution. Chileans are rather conservative, and there were some measures that were really resisted. First, uh, interculturalism, you know, to say that Chile was an intercultural state, uh, to give territorial autonomy to indigenous people, to have a parallel system of justice. This was really resisted in public opinion polls and, you know, in more uh, informal instances. And, and many Chileans read it like, these people are getting into the front of the line and I have been working all my life and why they have more rights than me. This type of conversation was part of every day. Uh, the second was, for example, uh, uh, interruption of pregnancy. Chile has three, uh, allows pregnancy only in three uh, circumstances. If the mother's uh, life is at risk, if the fetus is not compatible with life, or if uh, the woman was raped. But the new text said something like that the state should grant the conditions for voluntary interruption of pregnancy, period. So those who were, were against uh, abortion said so they can abort a baby of nine months old? I mean, is, is there going to be any limit to that? So many people were really like uh, against the constitution because of that. And then, you know, the role of the state was other thing that was uh, discussed a lot and the, emer the state of emergency that was removed from the constitution. But I think the most important issue were what I call the stridencies of the convention. It, it has to do with actions and declaration by conventionals that were so inappropriate, so, so, so inappropriate. And although these were isolated events, uh, the press covered it a lot, and it uh, made people uh, lose faith in the convention and lose faith in um, an eroded trust a lot in a country where trust is on the floor. I will put some examples for your entertainment. This guy interrupted his chemotherapy treatment to go to the street and ask for a better healthcare system. But then we realized that he didn't have cancer, that there was uh, plenty of these go found me things to, to help him pay for his so expensive treatment that didn't exist. Then you had this. Some of the conventional member went dressing customs to the convention, like Tia Pikachu and a dinosaur and whatever you want to see was there. Then this other case of a member of the convention who was, you know, asking for dignity and went to do her public declaration naked from the weight up. This is, this is probably my favorite. Uh, one of the conventional members who was voting while taking a shower and then this was uh, this was a right wing woman. It was not all, only the left. Uh, the mic was open. She didn't realize, and she was insulting, not insulting, cursing her fellow conventional members on national TV. Everything was open. So um, after this, I mean, it's obvious why the conventional process failed. You know, it was a joke in so many levels. The second attempt uh, to, to reform the Constitution was quite different. Uh, on November 2022, Congress agreed on a second process that was going to be much more top-down. So um, all political parties agreed on 12 issues that were the boundaries of the new Constitution. And they uh, and, and these 12 issues were quite moderate and obvious. And then they appointed a 
commission of experts that would work in a draft. So they would take these 12 points, write a draft that was quite moderate because it was comprised by uh, members of the opposition and members of uh, the officialism in equal parts. And then through popular election, a new constitutional council, look at the change of the name, so you don't confuse it with the previous fiasco, uh, um, took place in May uh, 2023, when 50 members were elected, and there was one reserved seat for an indigenous person. So were 50 elected plus one. There was gender parity in this convention, too. Now, when the election of convention has happened, that was an atomic bomb in political terms, because we swing from uh, having a convention of independent and left to having 22 seats of the 50 seats that went to the radical right, mm -hmm. like radical populist right. 11 to the traditional right, and 17 for the left. The center disappeared from the political spectrum, and independents received 0.5% of the vote. So they all also disappeared. Um, in this case, in order to modify or introduce an article, you needed three out of five uh, votes uh, and since the right dominated the process, they could do whatever they want. They didn't know the they didn't need the opposition to to do anything. So they wrote the constitution. It was revised by the commission of experts to make sure it was okay the the way it was written and and everything. And then it, we had the exit plebiscite. And the Constitution was once again rejected by 56% of the population. So why? Again, an informed guess. First, people were tired. You know, They didn't want to hear about the Constitution or anything. There was uh, a desgaste, an erosion of, uh, of, of voters. Second, uh, for many people, the Constitution went way too much in the conservative direction. It was just the opposite. It was like it was a, a swing to the right, and, and it, it was reflected in the text. And then there were very controversial issues. Because I'm running out of time, you can read them there. Um, but uh, again, this was too much for uh, people in the center of the political spectrum, and even for in the moderate right. Um, the other thing um, was that since the right had supported the previous constitution, the, the existing constitution, if they lost, they would win. Because the constitution prevailed, the constitution they wanted prevailed. So they can go, go nuts and extreme in this one, because otherwise, if it is rejected, they are going to win anyways. So uh, that explains the, the, the content. And also, in, in, in public opinion polls, it was clear that uh, public preferences and they worried about, they were worried about different issues. It was not pensions, healthcare, education, and all of these anymore in the top of the list. They were worried about crime, narco-trafficking, illegal immigration, public safety. So it was a very different um, context. And then, this is my favorite part of, of, of this slide. Uh, the most, uh, there was one guy that received a lot of votes. He is a member of the Republican Party, which is the extreme right um, of Chile. He's ultra-Catholic. Uh, like he's, he says he is not married to a woman because he's married to God, like very extreme. He belongs to Opus Dei, which is a very extreme um, Rama, how do you say? Uh, yeah, branch of the of the Catholic Church, 
And um, I think he scared the voters with some of his uh, speeches. I will put an example. The first one, I admire Pinochet. He was a great statesman. Qua, 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 qua. No. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't need to explain. This is the brother of this guy, and he's a very, very well known guy because he's a movie maker. Uh, and he said, my brother is a national uh, danger. Don't vote for him. <laughs> His own brother. And then this was one of the most polemical uh, things he said, was why the heck we need to negotiate with the minority if we are a majority? So it's a dictatorship of the majority against the minority. You know, it's bad, really bad. So, as you might imagine, this constitution was a, another fiasco. So, where are we now? And with this, I, I will close. Well, the, the things that originated social process are still here. You know, are, are still in the country, are, are, are there, people are still pissed off. And so, any moment, we can have a second social explosion. That's what I believe. The good news is that Congress agreed to lower the quorum to modify the Constitution to four sevenths. Uh, so now it's very easy to, to modify an article or to make an amendment to the Constitution. But for that, you need uh, to have agreements, you know, and to build coalitions. So the right is going to win, well, I will say this way. I think the right is going to win the next election. What we don't know is if it's going to be the extreme right or the moderate right. If the, if the uh, center right wins the next election, we might see negotiations on key issues with the center of the political spectrum and even the moderate left. However, if the radical right wins the election, I think things are going to be quite dramatic because one, they will be unwilling or unable to build coalitions that are broad enough to, to pass reforms. And second, uh, protesters will certainly go to the streets. So the the you know, things don't look that well for Chile. I, I am sorry, I'm so pessimistic. So if you want to know more, there are some articles I wrote about that. And pray for Chile, please. That's the only thing I can say. Thank you very much. 35 minutes, it was better than I thought. <laughs> Thank you. Um, that was remarkably informative. Uh, I'm excited for our discussion. We do have about 15 minutes uh, where we would like to bring you into the conversation. Uh, if you do need to leave uh, to get to some place um, in the next 15 minutes, you're welcome to do so now. But otherwise, we'd love to have you stay and participate with us. Uh, if you have a question, uh, we just invite you to raise your hand. Uh, Nate is in the back. Nate. Uh, can bring the microphone to you. Um, we just invite you to wait for the microphone to stand, introduce yourself briefly, um, and uh, ask your question. Uh, we'll go till 1 p.m. Um, and I'm actually going to start it off today, if that's all right. So uh, it appears that you're not terribly um, impressed with how this has turned out. Uh, and uh, I thought, you know, some of your speculation as to the reasons why the Constitution has failed to be reformed twice now uh, made a lot of sense to me. Um, the question I have is, uh, in retrospect, knowing what we know now, do you think that there was an, an institutional design flaw in the way that the constitutional conventions happened, um, or alternatively, uh, are we just in a place now in democracy where uh, we don't have the norms of trust and coalition building and 
the ability to reach consensus um, that might cause problems for any kind of institutional design as we try to, to redesign a, uh, a constitution. So uh, as she's answering that, please uh, think of uh, questions you'd like to ask, and uh, the time is now yours. Well, I have slides from a different talk that I didn't include now. But I think that rather than uh, problems in the flow, the way it was uh, thought about, you have to think that political parties in Chile, in all public opinion polls, have 3% of people trusting in political parties. Three. 5% trust in Congress, and I think 8% in the government. So imagine, political parties, 3%. So if you take into account the margin of error, error, it might be zero. If you ask people how much do you trust narco-trafficking, it might, you might get 3% too, you know. So uh, here what you have were political leaders that were not, I mean, they got through elections, but with the 50% of the population voting, uh, with most of the population don't trust them. So I think it, any design <laughs> was going to be problematic to start with because of the people who were writing it. However, uh, I think the hoja en blanco, this from scratch constitution, it never made sense to me. You know, I don't know if there is any other uh, experience in the world where you say, hey, put whatever you want here. I mean, it's crazy. There need to be some minimum boundaries, you know. Um, and I think that was part of the problem too, but obviously the second time there were boundaries and you see what it happened, so I don't know if I answer your question. But you need, I mean, what I learned when I did my PhD was that in order to have a democracy, you need political parties. And I still believe it's true, strong political parties. This is not a question, but Professor, can you put the diapositiva anterior para to take a photo? Ah, sí. Gracias. Oh, no, this is the... I don't, no, 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 no. This what I put all these. What? Do, oh, no, here. Sorry, I had extra slides in case you ask different questions. But here, de nada. Hi there. My name is Sam Johnson. Um, I am wondering, as a professor yourself, what advice would you have to, uh, to give to the young people in Chile, one who are looking to create reform and continue this process of creating a better country, but also for their personal success as they deal with the situation they're in? Well, one thing I try to emphasize always is the need to form broad coalitions. Um, I think this is a personal uh, opinion. I think identity politics is killing us, you know. Um, and this is something I, I talk a lot with my students. Even with the students, I don't share the, uh, their ideas. For example, with uh, students that are militantly feminist, okay? You, so I say always, why do you talk to each other? You don't need to gather with feminists to say there is inequality of gender, you know? What you need to do is to convince those who are against giving women more freedom or better salaries or whatever, and convince them. If you are in favor of the environment, don't go to other people that think the same you think. Try to convince those who think that we need to cut the Amazon, you know. So that that's the best the, the thing that I emphasize the most. You don't need to talk with people who think like you. You need to talk with those who are in the other side.
What would you say were some of the biggest collective action problems that they faced when coming together? Wow, that's interesting. And that's an entire class. <laughs> but I will make an effort to answer through this slide. So, these are different pictures from the protest. Some people were protesting for, well, well, you cannot see what it is behind, wait a second, you know, some, some people were criticizing the whole transition to democracy, the 30 years of democracy in Chile, others wanted dignity, sometimes, well, income was a big issue, uh, pensions, healthcare, um, inequality, and a new constitution. And look at this, this is one of my favorite slides ever from the protest. Look at what this person says. New constitution, respect for transgender, we are people, health, jobs, education, justice, housing, rights, abortion, and if the page was longer, you would see much more things, you know? So uh, something that you have to take into consideration is that there is no leader in these mobilizations. In 2011, Chile had a huge wave of mobilization, but was a student movement and were the leaders of the federations of uh, the main universities. So you could identify the leaders here, no idea. And then there were some collective actors, yes, those who wanted a public system of pensions were there. Those who wanted, I don't know, indigenous rights were there. But there were many individual actors or persons, you know, with their own signs asking for whatever. So um, that's a major collective action program, problem, you know. I think that's the worst part of it. Yeah, it, there is this song uh, of a rock uh, band in Argentina that says, no sé lo que quiero, pero lo quiero ya. I don't know what I want, but I want it now. And, it, and there was something like that here, I think. Um, two questions. So do you think that the lack of leadership in these protests is like inherently connected or correlated with the lack of consensus around a new constitution? And then second, so you talked about at the beginning how Chile was this almost model nation for democracy in Latin America. Do you think that it can become that again? Um, okay. The opinions there do not reflect my own opinions. It's just, <laughs> I have to say that. Uh, as a foreigner in Chile, I, I am Uruguayan originally. I got to Chile in uh, 2003, I think. And one of the things that caught my attention was public opinion polls. You, know? you cannot have a healthy democracy if people do not trust in institutions of democracy. You know, uh, and whenever I asked this, it was like, "What are you talking about?" You know, I, 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 I that was very surprising to me, and it was something that with other political scientists that are not Chilean, <laughs> we talked about all the time. So um, I think you need to build political parties. That's the key in my mind, you know, to look for a way. And the reforms that were adopted the last few years only er um, help disappear political parties. We have a huge level of fragmentation now. You know, it, everything is so fragmented that it's very difficult to negotiate in this uh, in this moment, and yes, I think when you have to negotiate, you need someone, an interlocutor, and I don't know the word in English, you know. Yeah, someone, a person, or two persons, or three, you know, to, to negotiate over something in concrete. You cannot negotiate with the street, you know, so, and, and the independence, I mean, the left thinking, that independence were going to be a solution because 
new faces, more democracy. You know, uh, there was a point I thought I was <laughs> having a personality problem that I needed help because it's, are you crazy? You know, it's it's a disaster. Anyways, I hope I didn't leave you like sad and. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just wondering, are there any unifying issues in Chile that large swaths of people can agree on? And I ask this because my in-laws live in Santiago, and what I hear about most is crime and the economy, those two things. And I'm wondering, are those things that are unifying at all? Does that help or does it hurt? Well, I mean, budget law. Let me tell you this. Boric is in his second year, you know, and we don't have a budget law, a real one. I mean, pieces of the law were approved. I mean, there was not possible to get an agreement over budget, which is something that generally is quite easy, straightforward. I mean, there are some issues you might discuss. So I don't know how unifying it is because um, polarization also runs around the, the neoliberal model, you know. So some want more state and some don't want more state. So this is difficult to negotiate. I don't think that Chileans want uh, a communist uh, country at all, but the, the difficult thing is that they want the state to be involved. They want more budget to education, pensions, whatever, but then when you propose a reform that brings solidarity, they worry about their own pension fund. So the state is going to take my money. You know, so it's very difficult uh, to, to bring those things together. Um, I, I don't know. I think in Congress it might be easier uh, to make agreements in specific issues, but if you see the program of President Boric, I mean, all the radical reforms he promised in healthcare, in education, a new national system of care, nothing happened. Nothing. Only one thing happened that was good. You know, uh, the, the now is uh, you don't have to pay for medical attention within the public system, but the public system doesn't have the capacity to treat everyone. So, yeah, I'm a, I, I am a skeptical about the future of Chile. I hope I'm wrong. Hi, thank you. So uh, you mentioned that politicians didn't see the explosion coming in 2019. Did scholars see it? Did sociologists, historians, uh, political scientists, were there people that were kind of forecasting this, or did it surprise everybody? Um, no, there were some scholars. I, I mean, there is the al always the opportunistic guy that says, I told you that it was going to come. When did you tell me? Where is the article? So there are plenty of people who claim uh, they saw it coming. Um, there are some scholars that say this is going to explode, yes. And then there were others, well, with my colleague uh, Cristobal Rovira, we wrote if you see one of the articles I I put there, the one that I wrote with Cristobal, was about the challenges of political representation. And we put together a, a special number in, in this journal. And, and that was what we were discussing. Is Chile going to have a, a representation crisis that is a, an explosion? or this is going to be, you know, uh, a smaller crisis than that, that the parties are going to solve. And we were inclined to think, to think that it was going to be a, a big crisis of representation. 
and other scholars that we met, uh, one of them, Peter Ciavellis, says, well, all the reforms that are passing now are in the right direction, but I think it might be too late for Chile. And other scholars, the same. She, uh, Jana Morgan, she studied the Venezuelan case, and she saw the same variables that were present in the case of Venezuela before Chavism in Chile. Uh, so I think, but we didn't, I think none of us saw this magnitude like 4.5 million people in the first month. 1.2 million in a single protest. I mean, that, no one saw it. Thank you.